Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. What's being referred to in the press as the opioid overdose epidemic is described as the deadliest drug crisis in American history, killing more people each year than guns or car accidents, causing more annual deaths in breast cancer, killing more people each year than all the Americans who died in Vietnam, and growing at a faster pace than the HIV epidemic at its peak. Like many other cities, New York is suffering from this phenomenon. The Corner Project in Washington Heights is doing what it can to deal with this crisis by offering support to people who are suffering the ravages of drug addiction. Its strategy, harm reduction, has been controversial in the past. But Liz Evans, the executive director, is here to tell us how harm reduction works and just how well it is working. Welcome. Thank you. Um, the Corner Project describes its mission as improving, trying to improve the lives of those who use drugs or, or are engaged in sex work. When did it get started and why? Uh, Corner Project was founded about 10 years ago and it grew out of the work of really one woman named Jamie Favaro who was walking around the community with a backpack with some syringes to hand out clean needles to people who weren't getting access to them. People who were living in the neighborhood who were injecting under bridges and in unsafe areas and she noticed when she was speaking to them that they were reusing dirty syringes which of course puts people at tremendous risk of communicable disease. So there are lots of programs in the city mm -hmm. that support people who are dealing with drug addiction. They're detox programs, they're residential drug treatment programs, outpatient drug treatment. But yours seems to have a specific focus. You know, I talked about harm reduction. What is harm reduction? Well, I like to explain to people that at any given time, and this is statistics from the um, Department of Alcohol and Substance Use, about one out of every 10 active drug users is engaged in some kind of treatment program. So that means at any given time there's nine who are not. And so that means there are many today, right now, people using drugs that are illegal as a way of coping with their life and there are no supports or there's nothing for them because they are actively engaged in drug use. So the vast majority of the supports that are out there that exist treat are, are abstinence based. Right. So harm are, reduction deals with people without requiring Abstinence. Right. Okay. Harm reduction approaches are target, targeted interventions to meet people where they're at right. in their active use. Like, right. So I'm not making it a condition of helping you to even necessarily talk about your drug use. I'm just trying to connect with you. And where so, you are. Where you're at. Yeah. And so I'm making the foundation of the interaction, the relationship, and I'm building on that relationship to try and meet a human being as a human being, acknowledge them and say, what are your needs? How can I help? And that lowering, that lowering that level of expectation and not trying to engage in necessarily fixing or curing means that I'm not putting my hopes and dreams onto you. I'm actually going to listen to you. Mm -hmm. And that makes a very different foundation for a starting point for someone who's maybe failed many, many times in detoxes and treatments already. There are different forms of harm reduction. I mean, we, uh, most people are familiar with, you know, the methadone clinics. Do you have them anymore? Yes, are they, they're, yes. they're still there. there okay. Many, yep. uh, so they give you methadone so you don't use heroin. Mm -hmm. um, it also includes things like a clean needle distribution and the distribution of uh, condoms. You know, I remember uh, in the city that, that, you know, the needle exchanges have been controversial mm -hmm. uh, in the past. Are they still controversial or are they less controversial? I think most people have accepted. I have never heard anybody criti critique uh, access to clean syringes to me personally or, or question it. Um, I feel as though generally the public has moved into a position of acceptance of the fact that dirty needles don't make sense and cause communicable diseases, so we need to provide people with clean ones. Mm -hmm. There are complications for drug users when they may get arrested and sometimes um, having syringes on people carrying syringes has been problematized. Um, so in spite of the fact that they're, it's legal to carry a clean syringe, I, I've heard stories of people getting in um, Is it trouble because, trouble they, because have they have syringes. So it's not always simple. So part of your program is, would, can it be called a needle exchange? That's, is that, do yeah. they, okay, how does it work? So we register people who are active drug users. They come in, they identify themselves, we ask them some questions, we do an intake form, and we register them in an anonymous identifier. 
which is usually a combination of numbers and letters. Um, and then they get a syringe exchange membership card, which allows them to become a participant of the program. If they have that card on them and they have syringes on them, then, then that's how the syringes somebody is carrying become legal. So as a registered participant of a syringe exchange program, um, people are waived from any kind of drug laws that would otherwise prohibit drug paraphernalia being carried on someone. So once they've become a member or a participant of the program, we really just try and ask them what we can do to help. What, what's their living situation? Do they need help getting out of a shelter into housing? Are they looking for work? Are they struggling with any family issues that they might need case management for? Are they receiving benefits? Have they had a hep C test? Have they had an HIV test? Are they at risk of contracting HIV or hep C from some high risk exposure that they might need to get treatment for? Um, do they have a doctor? Do they see anybody regularly in their life? Are they interested in detox? Do, would they like to go to treatment? And these things don't happen all at once. They happen over time and they happen at the pace that people are willing and um, interested in getting those supports. So if I'm a heroin user and I come in and I say, and they, I register and I say, well, I need some clean s syringes, mm -hmm. uh, you give them to them or can they get so many per week or how does that, how does that work? We just give people what they need. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Um, I was reading, um, I think it was an article uh, on CNN.com about your famous bathroom mm. um, where, you know, some of your clients, you know, have been known to go and shoot up perhaps after getting their clean needles. Now, some, some people would, would call this a safe injection site, but it isn't technically because such sites are not legal in this country, mm. correct? So the bathrooms at Washington Heights Corner Project are monitored for overdose, and it's a really important um, thing to do properly in the context of a syringe exchange, because of course there's a risk that somebody would collect their syringes and go and use in the bathrooms. And if that happened and they overdosed and died, it would be horrific. Um, and we know that people are dying in bathrooms all over the city. Um, Burger Kings, McDonald's, Starbucks staff are scared to let people use the bathrooms. There's increasingly complex uh, codes and access points and, and um, businesses um, come and ask us to train their staff in overdose reversal because this is an epidemic of death in the city and too many people are dying and their bodies are being found in a lot of these sorts of places. So our feeling is that it would be grossly irresponsible not to put into place the kind of precautions that are required to make sure nobody dies on our premises. So you were involved in the creation of a safe injection site in Canada. Was it, which city was it? In Vancouver. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but there are none that are legal in this country. No, there's a lot of um, people who've been working very hard for many years to try and bring the concept of supervised injection as a practice here to the states. And there's cities like Philadelphia, like Seattle, that have been talking about opening them. The mayors have supported them in those cities, and there's been steps made towards implementing them. Um, not one has opened yet, but, you know, it needs to happen fairly soon because okay. every day that we don't do it, more and more people are dying. Okay. Um and I would think that uh, another uh, harm reduction method, which you do use uh, in your program, is the use of, is it naloxone? That's right. Okay, okay. And we actually, I believe, you have the police who are using it now, and mm. tell me about that. Well, it's sort of amazing in New York, the police have been carrying naloxone for quite a while. I'm not exactly sure how many years, but that's a very progressive thing on, on in the, part of New York City to have done. A because long time it reverses ago. heroin. Because it overdose. changes the relationship of the police officer to the drug user. When they find them and they've overdosed, they can save their life. And that's a pretty powerful role for a police mm -hmm. officer to be in. And it has, I think, really changed to some extent the nature of that relationship, or it's improved it somewhat at least. And so when the police come onto the scene of an overdose, they know exactly what they need to do to reverse that person's overdose because naloxone binds to the opiate receptors and basically prevents the um, the respiratory depression from causing a respiratory arrest, which is what most opiate um, overdoses consist of. Mm -hmm. Tell me about some of the uh, other aspects of your uh, program. Um, 
I, on your website, I know you do condom distribution. I guess this would be uh, geared towards uh, prevention of HIV AIDS. And you even deliver condoms to homes and workplaces? Yeah, we do. We <laughs> deliver thousands of condoms every year. Do you? Yeah, do thousands. You? Yep. Um, we have them at the street side, at health fairs. We also have a team, a condom team, that go around to all the local businesses. They have great relationships with people in the community. Mm -hmm. um, yep, free, free condoms everywhere. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, you have a drop-in center. We do. Uh, tell me about that. So one of the experiences that I have had working with active drug users is that they're not welcome. There's not very much space for them, and yet they get vilified and treated very poorly. And a lot of people who ha are struggling with addiction um, and who may not be at that point where they're ready to go into a detox or treatment program have lots of issues in their life that they're still dealing with. And so having a low barrier drop-in just means having a space where people are welcome to come inside off the street and that is really culturally geared to them. Um, we're not the only one in the city, there's others, but in the, most of them are in the context of existing syringe exchange programs. And so there's spaces where we welcome people indoors and we invite them to talk to us about what's going on in their life um, and have relationships. So we do some programming, we have groups, we have case management, and of course we have primary care on site um, in partnership with New York Presbyterian. And um, we also um, involve people who come to our center in different um, jobs. So we hire people directly from the drop-in center to go through peer training courses where they can learn about how to be harm reduction peer workers and to give back um, into the community, into the work. Okay, so they can come and they can see a doctor, they can see a nurse, they can mm -hmm. talk about possible treatment. Uh, I, you, you also offer 60-second HIV testing. I mean, that's a real, I mean, I know it's been around a while, but that's a real leap forward from the 80s yeah. when you went to the doctor to be tested and then you had the long wait over yeah. the weekend or whenever to yeah. find out. Yeah, I mean, we, we can basically tell somebody in 60 seconds and it's a very important thing obviously to whether they're HIV positive or not yeah and then once that test result is there if it's a positive then we take them to the hospital where we do a confirmatory test with them so um, and then they get connected to care and we follow them so we have peer workers and health workers that stay in touch with folks and make sure that we're navigating with them through the system which can often be a pretty unwelcoming place for folks that are drug users. How many people do you serve in the course of a year? Oh, we have probably 300 a day in our drop-in who come in and out throughout the day. Um, it's thousands. I'm not sure exactly of the yeah. number, to be honest. I can get that number, but okay. it's thousands. We're going to take a short break, then we'll be back with Liz Evans after this message. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy, and I'm talking with Liz Evans, Executive Director of The Corner Project in Washington Heights. Um, there's so much talk about the opioid uh, addiction crisis these days. Uh, everybody's writing about it, everybody's reporting on it. Reportedly, about 42,000 people a year are dying from drug over overdoses of opioids, whether it's illegal drugs like heroin and fentanyl, or whether it's uh, prescription drugs. Have you, I know you've only been at uh, the Corner Project for two years, but is this reflected, has there been a change in the clientele there that, re, that um, um, reflects what's going on nationwide? You know, I think that the national epidemic or the what is called the overdose epidemic has a lot to do with the fentanyl in the drugs. Um, and we have seen increased rates of fentanyl because we are providing drug users with test strips that they can use themselves. They're like little pregnancy strips um, so they can test their drugs. So we know... So it uh, tests whether there's fentanyl present in... Present or not. Okay. That's it. Okay. So we do know that we have been detecting fentanyl or that the participants have been detecting fentanyl. We also know that we've performed, I think, over 65 overdose interventions just in the last year. Um, which means a lot of people, and that's in the community. So people will come to our drop-in and grab people and say there's, you know, somebody down the re road or there's somebody in the car, or there's somebody in the park. So our staff are out and around in the neighborhood doing overdose interventions quite often, mm -hmm. as well as obviously on, in our own space if somebody overdoses. Um, it's been... Uh, 
really eye-opening for me to also see that um, the, sh the sort of increasing level of um, overdose awareness has led the conversation to the point where people somehow think that this is new and yet it's been going on in communities like the Bronx, like other um, poor communities for a long, long time. Overdose deaths have been with us for a long time. I think a lot of the, the new conversation is because um, now we're talking, you're talking about a lot of people who are addicted to prescription drugs. Yeah. Do you see many of those at your center or is it mostly people um, who are dealing with illegal drug addiction? Yeah, I think that uh, there's definitely folks who use Xanax and they've found that um, fentanyl is cut also in Xanax. I've seen those folks when we've been on outreach and talked to people who use pills. There's lots of people who've always used pills. I'm not sure if they're being prescribed them. I'm, a lot of people buy them. Yeah. Um, I don't see people who are taking their own prescriptions and having issues with those in our services. You don't services. see those. So it, in the it's, services that we're providing. So it's primarily uh, people who are using heroin and the fentanyl. Is that primarily what you see? Purchasing drugs on the illegal market okay. generally are the folks that use our services because they have gotten to the point where they are dependent on something mm -hmm. that they need to get a hold of and they can't get it through a prescription. Um, I don't quite understand. Um, the opioid crisis as 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 has been depicted um i guess what as i said i think what people have picked on is that you have a lot of people who are now using prescription drugs and and abusing the use of prescription drugs um but if it seems to me that if people are taking prescribed drugs mm -hmm. to relieve chronic physical pain uh, not to achieve a chemical high um is that really an addiction or is that really abuse? I, you know, that puzzles me. I don't know if you have an opinion on that or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I'm, my background is nursing. And when I started doing this work, I, I was really thrown into a situation where I was surrounded by a lot of people who were active drug users. I was running a housing project and about 70% of the people that were living in the housing project that I was running were injecting heroin. 70%? Yeah, it was a very densely populated, low-income neighborhood. And in the housing project, it was an SRO hotel for folks that were living in poverty. And a lot of the people that lived there couldn't live anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up running this building and, and supporting the people that were living in the housing and providing them with clean needles and just kind of learning on the job about what life was like on a day-to-day -day basis for folks that use drugs. And what I did then for the next sort of 20 years was really develop relationships and learn who people were and learn and listen to their stories and figure out how they ended up in the situation that they did. So I have since that time met hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who struggle with active substance use or chemical dependency. Um, and f consistently across the group of folks that I've met and worked with, I would say the single most common denominator is self-hatred and low self-esteem, feelings of worthlessness, feeling that their lives don't matter, feeling unseen, unconnected, uncared about. And there's something about opiates, there's something about chemicals that help people cope and numb those feelings of pain and help people get through. And what I've seen happen when harm reduction gets implemented in, in, a, in, a, in a caring, thoughtful way is that people can slowly start to rebuild that self-esteem and think maybe they matter enough because what you're saying to a person when you're bringing them either a clean needle or a safe space where they can hang out or an injection site is, I care about you enough to make sure you don't get sick, to make sure that you don't die of an overdose. And that's because I wanna make sure you live another day. Right. It's because I care about you. I don't want you to get HIV. I don't want, I don't, dead people don't detox yeah. for one thing. And so it sends this different message, which ultimately I, I believe a lot of the complexities of this very complicated addiction story, it, in my simple way of thinking about it, can be reduced to people not caring about themselves. What are the racial, dem ethnic demographics of your clientele? Are they largely, you're in Washington Heights, a large yeah. Latino population, are they largely Latino and black? Do you have a, mm -hmm. or, or what? 
We have a we have a high Latino population. We have a high Black population, and we also have a percentage that are white. So we have a mix. Um, mm -hmm. I would say we were about fifty percent Latino, about thirty percent Black, and about twenty percent white. Okay. Like that. Okay. Um, I've read the statistics over time. Are we we're talking about this whole pain management things mm -hmm. and different types of pain that people are trying to manage. Um, Afri black people tend to be prescribed um, painkillers, drugs for pain, at something like a 50% lower rate than white people for the same level yeah, of pain. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of been my, my theory that perhaps you have, uh, in the past at least, have had a relatively high rate of heroin use, uh, illegal drug use among blacks because they couldn't get or didn't get um, prescribed drugs, you know, comfort yeah. drugs. And that is a way that they relieve their pain, whether it's psychological pain or whether it's physical pain. Um, and now with all of this concern over the so-called opiate um, crisis, it, it seems like you have overprescription of opioids largely to a white clientele and underprescription of pain relieving drugs to uh, people of color, mm. um, and that perhaps all of this concern about um, uh, opioid addiction might be affecting people's ability to get uh, pain relief who might have been able to get it before. Yeah, it's very complicated, and one of the things that I've heard is that people respond to pain management differently anyway. So just because you're prescribing a person opiates doesn't mean necessarily that's going to manage their pain. And in mm -hmm. fact, only in about 20% of patients does opiates successfully manage pain. Really? Yeah, So the, and, but they tend to get used because they're what Medicaid pays for, or what, what, pay, what insurance plans will cover. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a whole variety of other ways of managing pain, like things like acupuncture, like things like physiotherapy. There's all sorts of other interventions that you can do with people with chronic pain. And we have a lot of folks who have become um, addicted through, for instance, an injury at work, back pain, ended up using opiates and then ended up becoming addicted to other things. And the storyline is, is always complicated. There's always many factors. It's never a simple straight line, in my opinion, not from what I've heard, that there's always these other issues going on for folks, right? Yeah. Um, but we are not really looking at treating the whole person and all of their pain and the sources of that pain. And we don't treat people equally in the medical system because there is racism in this country and the way people have been treated has been very different. And I do think that if you look at studies about how pain is perceived when patients in hospitals are interviewed and asked about how much pain they're in, and there's like known evidence that people of color are not taken as seriously when they say they're in pain as somebody who's white, so they don't get the same treatment. There is no evidence? No, there is. There, there is, is right, definitely right. evidence. I mean, they've seen it in childbirth, they've seen it in yeah. managing stats around, you know, pain. Now, you have, you, uh, you have worked in uh, Canada, obviously. Uh, is the opioid addiction crisis we're seeing in the United States, is that something unique to the United States, or is it happening in other places as well? Um, the fentanyl, the introduction of fentanyl right now into America is the recent, but of course the overdoses, the overdose deaths that are happening here are at a rate and at a scale that um, are also happening in other places around the world. The sort of global issue of addiction is global, um, but America is late to the table in terms of harm reduction strategies. There's over 30 countries around the world that have had supervised injection sites for many, many, many years and have seen the, the rate of opiate use go down as a result of implementing much more whole scale sorts of harm reduction uh, programs f like in Switzerland who for over 30 years have had supervised consumption sites all over the country in addition to heroin maintenance programs and in that 30 year period they've seen opiate use drop by almost 80 percent. So it's not new but how we're dealing with it mm -hmm. is very old so right. we've been engaged in this war on drugs in this country for many many years which is really in some ways seeped into the DNA of how we think about what the problem is. And in my opinion, until we start to think differently about what the problem is, we're going to continue to implement solutions that don't work. We're going to continue to see people die, families get torn apart, communities destroyed, people incarcerated, and for what? It, we have, we're not winning. The war has not been 
one. And it's really not a war on drugs, it's really a war on people. It's a war on people. It's yeah. been in this country a war on people of color, and it's also been a war on people who are poor. And I think what's convenient is we've been able to use this narrative that the drugs themselves are the problem to then not really consider all these other harms that are being caused by the policies that we've implemented around how we treat people who use drugs. And harm reduction as a philosophy just sort of says, okay, let's look at that array of harms, including things like incarceration, including things like um, banning people from services and not letting them in or whatever kinds of exclusionary policies that have occurred as a result of this sort of demonization of people who are struggling with drug use. It's politely called stigma, but it's so deep in the DNA of how we think about people who use drugs. I, I think stigma is far too soft a term because we're really brutalizing people and we're allowing them to die. We treat them worse than we would treat a stray cat. If you're a drug user and you go into the emergency department, oftentimes, I mean, I'm not, you know, hospital staff have a hard job and I know they try very hard but it is not uncommon to be treated highly disrespectfully and to be dismissed yeah. and not to be listened to and not to be considered as a real person and when you get treated that way repeatedly over and over again it just compounds those already existing feelings of worthlessness which leads people to continue to right. use more drugs right. so how we think that that's helpful in terms of ending this epidemic it just it, it drives me crazy. Also, if you think about it in education terms, if you've got a kid in a classroom who's struggling, you know, we know well now, we don't stand over them and scream at them and, or hit them or lock them in the closet or right. tell them they should do better. But somehow in this thinking we have around the drug war the mentality that is seeped into the way we think about drug users, we haven't made that leap that actually being kind to people and helping them might actually help yeah. them with, manage their drug use. Well, that's a good way to end our conversation <laughs> about a very, a very, you know, what, uh, what I'm realizing is a very complicated it is issue. Complicated. Uh, but I'm afraid we're out of time. Oh. I do want to thank Liz Evans for joining me today. For more information about the Corner Project in Washington Heights, you can visit its website, cornerproject.org. For One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy. <laughs>